So I'm here with Zoomer Schopenhauer, who I suppose is well known on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter, so I don't know about such things. His name is Marcus, and he would like to have a discussion about Platonism and naturalism, as I understand it. So why don't you go ahead and explain, you know, where are you coming from? What's your perspective on Platonism, et cetera? Okay, so I just run this like medium-sized um, account on Twitter called Zoomer Schopenhauer. I've basically been associated with um, Joel Davis's clique for several years at this point in terms of thinking about political theory and, and related matters. But recently, um, I've just seen that the rise of people turning towards classical philosophy and Platonism, I think as a response to Volker Nietzscheanism, Keith Woods' influence, and, and a number of other people. I mean, it's obviously been like a kind of a perennial part of this kind of sociological sphere, but it's it's kind of come relevant recently. And I think it's because people want to have a kind of rational basis for their worldviews. I mean, as is fundamentally important, and that's something that I agree with. But I think that despite the fact that the Western canon and these traditional works, Plato, Aristotle, are worth reading, studying, taking seriously, and they have a lot of fundamentally correct things to say on things like ethics and so forth, I think that in the 21st century, you're essentially adopting a very fringe and very untenable position, broadly speaking. Although there is always kind of niche versions of things. I mean, for example, with Aristotelianism, you could adopt like a sort of weak dispositionalist position like John Heil or Nancy Cartwright, or there's kind of weak forms of mathematical Platonism, which I think are certainly on the table. But when it comes to sort of adopting, you know, the philosophy of mind, the ontology or epistemology of people from thousands of years ago, I think it's quite naive to think that they're going to hold up. And I think that the reason why people are kind of liable to go against the mainstream in academia and to go against the mainstream in different institutions as it's generally upheld is because of sort of things which they're not willing to admit and that they are untruthful or dishonest about in more political areas and then just to assume that this sort of carries over into other areas and so I can understand why people are far more open to fringe and I certainly want to address anyone's arguments that they specifically adduce. So that would generally be my thoughts. Okay. So I'm getting that Platonism has value historically, but we shouldn't expect the metaphysics and philosophy of mind to hold up. Yeah, I don't know why that would even be the case. I don't see why metaphysicians 3,000 years ago should be worse than metaphysicians today, a priori. The basic line of reasoning from a Platonist perspective as to why we might expect to have access to metaphysical truth is that we are part and parcel of the world. Our innermost structure, it seems reasonable to suppose, would mirror the innermost structure of the wider world. So I don't see any prima well, facie I think that... case being made against that kind of, you know, first principled a priori philosophizing. Yeah, in an a priori sense, you wouldn't expect that just because somebody came from a particular time zone, that their position is more true or false than someone at another time zone. But what you kind of have to remember is that, well, I'm sure you're not accusing you of forgetting, but people who lived back in these periods did not have access to the level of scientific information, and they believed in radically different cosmogonies and cosmologies, which today seem very much implausible based on the kind of information that we have. I think that if you are Aristotle, then his philosophy of mind makes absolute sense within his own way of going about things. But after you know about things like evolution and contemporary physics, not so much. I mean, the term which Bachelard uses for this in the 20th century context as a sort of decent first half of the 20th century philosopher of science is that a lot of the traditional categories of metaphysics, when you were trying to use them to understand what is being brought to the table by sort of the revolutions in the first half of the 20th century physics, they're, they're what he called an epistemological obstacle to actually understanding what's going on. And so I would say that the two broad intuitions 
the kind of motivate naturalism are that we kind of evolved our sensory organs, which we've been endowed with, to interact with the world via evolution. And so you wouldn't necessarily expect them to give you a kind of insight into the fundamental structure of reality. You would expect them to be useful when socially engaging or engaging with sort of medium-sized objects, moving at medium speeds and hunting, these kind of basic tasks, but not, not into intuiting the nature of reality. And the other insight is that effectively, as I said, when you start to move into very advanced theories like general relativity, QM, any of the modern things that we have, then you are having these models which are extremely successful, but which seem to violate prima facie the kind of ordinary way that we think about things. Mm. Now, I mean, I, no, I, I totally is... disagree. Go ahead. I, I think ahead. Um, they do violate quantum mechanics, violates intuitive naturalist metaphysical categories. It actually does not violate the traditional Greek metaphysical scheme, the Pythagorean scheme. The concept of matter for the Greeks was formlessness and indefiniteness. And form is introduced onto this base formless substrate with soul. And what happens in quantum mechanics? Well, prior to observation, unless measurement is made, matter is indefinite, just as the Pythagoreans thought. We also have a, a rise of information reductionalism in physics today. I'd say that's a mainstream kind of consensus position at this point. And that, I mean, what is information reductionalism? What is information? Weisaker, 20th century physicist and philosopher, basically equates information with form in an essay I read from him recently. And that is, I mean, essentially what we're dealing with in information reductionalism. It's saying that basic properties of material systems are all reducible to the most elementary distinctions we can draw. And in information science, obviously that's a bit, it's a binary distinction, presence or absence. And that is kind of the quantum of form and any additional formal properties have to be built up from that. But this is not inconsistent with a Pythagorean Platonic metaphysics, which says that number is the basis of all things, of all form. So I, yeah, I just completely disagree. I think the Greek metaphysical system is vindicated by modern. I think um, there, there's not, a couple not of the 18th, base. 19th century naturalist one. I think that there's a couple of vague senses in which this kind of worldview is vindicated because I think that with QM, you have the first return in mainstream physics of a kind of ontological sense of possibility rather than just a sort of like in statistical mechanics where you say that it's possible that gas molecules could be in these areas, but this is just a calculational device. They are actually all in particular states, whereas in QM, it's the first time in which you see some kind of a notion of an ontological realization of some kind happening that can't be kind of reduced away in any obvious sense. But I don't think that the kind of spaces of possibilities or, you know, quantum fields or information that's being talked about is necessarily that similar to what the Greeks are talking about outside of a fairly broad metaphorical sense, I suppose. Well, Wolfgang Smith is an active contemporary physicist, and he says, I mean, basically an Aristotelian interpretation of actuality and, and potential maps onto quantum mechanics just fine. Yeah, well, so, Wolfgang Smith also basically kind of skirts around the edge of like geocentrism. <laughs> like, um, right. I, mean, I, 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 I mean, do we become heliocentrics uh, again? I, no, relativity kind of eliminates that idea. And since we're the observers and we're on the Earth, that does kind of render the Earth at the center of things. Uh, a reference frame is defined by an origin point. Anything we observe in the cosmos uh, <laughs> is defined relative to us as that origin point. The central reference frame for practical purposes is the Earth and nowhere else in the theory of relativity. Like where else would the center of things 
B. Are you going to put it in the sun? I mean, you can say the sun is the center of the solar system, but for practical purposes, the Earth is the center of the cosmos for us. Yeah, but not in an objective sense. I mean, the actual sun is at the center of the solar system. Right, yeah, which I acknowledged, but what's at the center of the cosmos? I don't think we can identify any given I think that that's kind of a tautological statement that, like, obviously for us, the Earth is the center of, of our cosmos within our own reference frame, but it, it's not the only reference frame, so... Sure. But since simultaneity, uh, velocity, all these physical properties are defined relative to a given reference frame, and our given reference frame is on the Earth, that does mean a form of geocentrism is as valid as heliocentrism, maybe more valid in a certain way. But, I mean, that is kind of a semantic point, and it's what you choose to, to label these things. But going yeah, back well, to... Also, choosing the Earth is also somewhat of a semantic point, because is it the Earth as like a holistic thing or could you be more solipsistic about it and say that you know essentially wherever i am at the particular moment time t is a, you know the reference point so yes you could do that but we are entangled as observers bringing in more quantum mechanical notions with the broader biosphere and what we have access to in terms of observation is bound up with what other human beings around the earth have access to when we make measurements i mean it's not literally the perspective of an individual scientist that we're, we're tracking. It's kind of what human beings have causal access to that yeah. determines a lot of things. So in any case, I want to go back to uh, yeah. this point that you made that we shouldn't expect our cognitive faculties to be able to grasp ultimate reality because our sense organs evolved. But I'd like to use Chris Langan's notion of syndiphonesis here where when we describe the relation between our mind and the nature of physical reality, we're placing two kind of linguistic objects in a common syntax necessarily, just to suppose the coexistence of mind and matter. We are reducing them at some level to obeying certain common syntactic laws. So while it may be possible that our sense organs don't reveal the nature of ultimate reality, it would have to be the case that the fundamental structure of the mind at some level would map onto the fundamental structure of physical reality. The mind can't be absolutely disparate from physical reality or else they're not two things. Well, in the way that I would respond to this is saying that I think that there has to be some kind of isomorphism between known and known. There has to be some kind of um, intrinsic relation or, you know, intentionality from the mind towards the world or, you know, thought and being. But the question is, I don't think that that communion automatically gives you any form of knowledge. And so whilst I think that there's a kind of direction where, you know, whenever you think of something, you're you're thinking of something. To think something is to think being and so on. Well, I, I accept that, but that doesn't give you any sort of knowledge. And so whilst, yes, there is an intrinsic correlation between thought and being, I don't accept the kind of two alternatives to this view, which I've heard, which is you have uh, the nylon barren view of Ray Brassier, which is that actually thought communes with the nothing. And then there's the alternative view from the speculative realists, which is that somehow you can have this intuitional access to reality thought of in a radically independent way so I, I would accept that but the thing is is that what i don't accept is that the categories which we use to think have to map on to the categories of reality because those categories are culturally historically contingent and don't have to in any sense map onto the categories of reality in of itself well sure and that's pretty clear because people have erroneous categories. Historically, they have generated such schemes, but I'm not defending kind of just that human beings innately have access to the nature of reality. You have to follow a certain kind of scientific course. And Platonists describe that. I mean, the Republic, they talk about how you have to go through the mathematicals, understand the nature of mathematical objects, which is also identified as kind of essential to the nature of soul. Soul and mathematical objects exist at the same level in the Platonic hierarchy. They're in the same hypostasis. 
And so that is that kind of common link between the nature of the world in itself and the nature of us in ourselves. Okay, well, I mean, I mean this is a good answer. Number? Because... Do you think number is arbitrary and culturally conditioned, or is that just a feature of both think, mind um, and mind? Th this, is, this is a salient point. I think this is one potential answer to the problem, which is to say that the mathematical resources which we've developed map onto the nature of reality. I think that it runs into a number of problems. I think it's kind of an overconfident position because I think that in order to have this make sense, you have to subsume mathematics somehow into one unified framework, which in the contemporary era with the amount of mathematics we have, it's not obvious that you can do that. In the 19th century, they thought that you could unify all of it under either logic, formal logic, or under set theory. More recently, they've tried category theory. And you run into the kind of girdle tarski problems. You run into problems with being able to just reduce mathematics to all just one framework. And when you look at how physicists and scientists apply these mathematical frameworks, that they apply a particular mathematical framework. They often use kind of arbitrary methodologies where they're just like, running around with equations and factorizing, doing different mathematical tinkering, they, they eventually happen to run into something which works well. So I think that practically speaking, you kind of, I think there's something true here, but I think that it's not so easy to say that you can have some kind of one-to-one -one isomorphism here. Okay, so Platonists do have an explanation, and Gödel was a Platonist. They yeah. have an explanation for why mathematics would have this deficiency. It's because dianoetic knowledge, discursive reason, cannot ground itself. It has to be grounded in something that isn't based on operations, isn't based on some algorithm. It has to be based on an intuition, something that's stable, that is direct, you know, that grounds uh, axioms in formal systems. I mean, Platonists are very explicit about this. You can't justify Euclid's axioms using mathematical reasoning, you have to ground them using a deeper cognitive faculty intuition that we have. And that's a popular school of you know, mathematical epistemology, intuitionism. Not that it's the only contender out there, but it, it does make sense of Gödel incompleteness. I mean, that's essentially what Gödel proved is you can't prove every true proposition using uh, mathematical reasoning. Right. We have to be relying on something intuitive that is not formalizable, that you know can't be drawn out into a series of steps. So, I mean, that kind of vindicates the Platonist position that there oh, is- Oh, I mean, you, you, you have- um, Thing in mathematics kind of, that grounds mathematical truth. You have obviously non-Euclidean geometries, which have had very successful applications. So how do you know that your mathematical intuition is going to map onto something that is the, the structure of reality. Because people have had intuitions where they think the one framework is the best when actually you can get much more out of a different framework. I mean, I'm not saying that intuition is not an important part of mathematics or mathematical discoveries, or you know, someone thinks that you will be successful in using this framework uh, in actually disclosing the nature of reality, but I don't think that there's, a, there's any kind of necessary connection and there's no a priori way to know that your intuition will have to be successful. Right. If you read Proclus on Euclid's elements, it is clear that the elements presented in Euclid's work are given pedagogically and chosen somewhat arbitrarily. And Proclus was aware of that. Euclid wasn't the only person to write in elements of geometry. These are pedagogical works. And I, I think modern interpreters who just didn't read Proclus assume too much about what Euclid assumed to be universally true. So part of Platonic philosophy and epistemology is a hypothetical deductive method. So we don't assume that we have perfect access to these intuitions. We use these intuitions to guide us and you can't avoid using those intuitions to guide mathematical reasoning. But we also kind of take a step back and say, well, well we don't really know that our intuitive faculty is refined enough, is actually accessing those you know, eternal truths or not. And the process of philosophy is purifying ourselves so that our intuitive grasp on those forms, on those fundamentals improves through time. It's not like a binary thing. We definitely have 100% access to intuitive truth or we don't. Euclid's elements 
just as given with the axioms that he in fact uses, it's not like he was that far wrong. I mean, non-Euclidean, more generalized systems of geometry don't contradict the things that Euclid says. They, They go beyond and describe other kinds of systems, just like, you know, Newtonian physics Uh, Newton was relying on certain basic intuitions and definitions and axioms in his system. And it's not like his intuitions were 100% wrong. He just didn't examine a broader scope of possible systems. Whenever you get a new theory, you can't just abandon everything which the previous theory brought to the table. You have to incorporate them as new results. And obviously, Einstein obviously brings in Newton's equations as you know, limit cases, and they have to be explained within the new replacing framework. But so I I do think that there actually is such a thing as a possibility for progress in the natural sciences to happen. I mean, obviously, yeah, my problem is with Plato's um, epistemology, at least as it's presented in some of the dialogues, because I think that really the the Western canon starts out, or at least the kind of broad sense of the Western canon, begins with this Parmenidean insight that being has to be intelligible because if it's not given for thought, then it's not thinkable. And so, you know, thought has to be related to being and, you know, being is one and it's indestructible. And so, but the problem with that is that it led into being, being in fact, unintelligible because a sort of an empty one being, which has to be all of the particular diverse things that we see whilst also essentially has to be nothing and it doesn't seem to appear to us in any kind of intuition, any kind of finite, sensible intuition. And so obviously the, the, the Platonists, they say, well, this kind of basic insight seems to be true, but it can't explain change. And so you have to create the forms as the kind of intelligible, finite contents of things which are kind of, you know, ultimately all mediated within the form of the good being what determines how close something can be to the the sort of the model. And the problem is is that in order to have this work, you need to have an epistemology of how you actually encounter these and use them. And the problem I have with Platonism is is really the the doctrine of anamnesis. That seems to me to be the, the key thing, which is really, really difficult for me to accept that essentially for Plato, you need to have a vague memory of these forms from some kind of a past life. You know, you encounter things and you only are able to make sense of them via the use of the ideas, which is an idea which I think actually is basically true. But how do you get these ideas and essentially anamnesis? And that's why I would automatically side with Aristotle here, because Aristotle thinks that the kind of sensible encounter is um, a necessary and sufficient condition for intellecting actually processing, understanding the forms from the point of view of the subject. But I think Aristotle runs into a number of issues here as well. And really, the reason why I would tend towards a kind of a nominalism is it's it's kind of a semantic issue. It's just that you, you're asking what the kind of words that you're using are, are doing. And I think that nominalism is really just making explicit what's implicit when you are using these words. But nonetheless, I think that you do need some kind of a categorical functional framework for making sense of things. So I would kind of side with Kant against Hume on on that one. In that Hume refused to build that categorical framework and Kant went ahead and did it? Well, yeah, in the sense that Kant thinks that you have to make use of categories and you have to make use of conceptual categories in order to have an experience. Intuition without concept is empty concept without intuition is blind. I think that this is a valid point. I mean, I think that Maimon's critique of Kant, which is that he doesn't actually address Hume's skepticism here, is also valid, though, because just because you refuse the kind of empiricist logical atomism in terms of understanding things doesn't mean that you've actually addressed the fundamental skepticism that, well, you use the categorical framework, but how do you actually know in fact, you know, quid facti, that this actually applies. You, you've only described a sort of a possible cognitive system. You don't know that it has to apply universally for all time because you're still stuck within radical finitude. 
And of course, Maiman's solution here is to reject Kant entirely and to go back to Leibniz because, because Kant's distinction, sharp dualism between sensibility and understanding leads to these problems. So you say we well, have to go back to, to Leibniz and essentially have all empirical perceptions be some kind of confused form of intellection. Okay. And I mean, what's your perspective there? Because I'm also inclined to go back to Leibniz. And Leibniz well, was my, my perspective is that I think that Kant's dualism here is not something that you can dissolve without falling into incoherence or just collapsing into a kind of myth of the given. And so I tend to think that um, the problem with Kant is that he makes the, the problem with him um, with Aristotle after the problem with Plato, because the problem with Plato's epistemology of the forms is that it runs into anamnesis. The problem with Aristotle's is a little bit more complex. It's that effectively you have the sensible impression of the substantial form, but essentially he just thinks that this is, he says that it's like a signet ring in, you know, putting itself onto a stamp, that it's just like this kind of given thing. And the problem with that is, well, all of these categories are things which you have it presupposes language acquisition. And whenever you say a particular category, like you say the snow is white, that presupposes a whole load of other knowledge. It presupposes that snow is a colored thing and therefore knowledge about other colors and so forth. Like you kind of have to, I, I agree with Quine and Sellers that you, you need a kind of a semantic holism here. And so there's, there's the trickiness of like where the substantial form from nature versus the substantial form in the sense impression. But then the problem with Kant is that what he says is that the kind of the functional aspect of consciousness, the functional side of consciousness, which is essentially self-conscious judgment via the pure concepts of the understanding, well, he thinks that is just what is given, as in he thinks that this is this automatic thing which you can just immediately glean from reflection upon what you're doing when you're thinking. Well, that's kind of dissatisfying. Where, where do these things come from? Why is thinking necessarily judging? Where do these concepts actually come from? How are they actually learned? And so I don't think that it's possible to just dissolve the dualism between sensibility and understanding. I think that you have to change it into a distinction between signification of a concrete linguistic community and a sort of historically contingent functional categorical framework and a sort of a transcendental community rather than this kind of absolutely positive transcendental subject. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so yeah, that would be my perspective on the categories, at least. Now, I don't really understand how nominalism is supposed to work at just a basic level in that uh -huh. if a system of categories, we kind of bootstrap ourselves and it is not an image, right? That's kind of Plato's semantic theory that names uh, and concepts or images, I mean, his whole ontology is based on emanations, reflections, images, archetypes, and paradigms casting out their likenesses. So that's the way language works for Plato. Um, but like, if, if that is, does not hold true, if our sensibility at a lesser degree, our opinion or doxa, I mean, this is Plato's basic epistemological model, doxa opinion is a closer likeness to the realities, and then dianoetic knowledge is yet closer, and then those kind of key insights into the forms when we have them, and it is quite rare that we have them, those are the closest likeness to reality because the least ephemeral, the most enduring, and like, okay, if you're a mathematician and you do a bunch of math all the time, uh, you're, you're more likely to like grasp these essential fixed forms that endure across many formal systems. And these are valid because they are likenesses to the nature of reality itself. If that relation of likeness doesn't ground truth for uh, our representation, then what does? Like, how does nominalism work? Well, generally speaking, I would accept um, a metalinguistic version of nominalism, which is to say that I tend to think that these kind of nominalizations where you would say something like redness is a meta language which describes a commonality between distributive singular terms which refer to concrete objects. And so in other words, something like redness, it doesn't refer to an abstract entity out there. It refers to an adjective which refers itself to concrete particulars. Why does the adjective function to grasp different things in the world? What is the commonality? It can't just be pure discrete particulars. 
Well, the thing is, is that I think that the idea of a pure bear particular is not even a coherent idea in and of itself. Like, I don't, I don't understand what that would be. It right. would have no being. The thing is that, yeah, I think that these nouns are relating to like patterns which are out there. But I think that really nominalism is just a semantic thing talking about what, what language is doing. And I think it's a kind of necessary point, though, because it avoids this platonic conception of language, which is this resemblance picture, where it's this resemblage to, to images. That's kind of broadly speaking what the scientific revolution in the early modernity was about is you had the movement away from understanding things via their resemblances. Because, I mean, the reason why nominalism, there are some people who are kind of fed up with the nominalism Platonism debate because, you know, they say, well, how could possibly like this debate about this abstract thing in the 12th century have any relevance for us? Intuitively speaking, it doesn't seem immediately obvious why it's so important to philosophy of mind or ontology or epistemology, but it kind of is albeit I don't know if it has some kind of grand historical importance, but in early modernity, you stop thinking of something like a circle in terms of its resemblance to an ideal image of a circle. But you say you can rigorously define a circle in terms of AX plus BY equals C. And the point is that there's absolutely no resemblance between the algebraic equation, which defines rigorously what a circle is, to what it is. And you think of like a timeline, like you draw a physical line like what resemblance does that have to, to time in itself? You think of literally like Copernicus, where you know he's talking about the motions of the planets and he's not looking to what it resembles for us. He's saying that he has these mathematical representations which describe the motions of the planet. That's what we need to substitute for what we think of in terms of our resemblances. Um, and so I generally think that modern philosophy is not so much a crisis of subjectivity, which is what some people think of it as in terms of Descartes as a, a thinker of subjectivity, I think that actually Descartes is a thinker of, of representation. I mean, you think of Descartes principles of mathematics, where he, you know, creates the graph, like literally invents the graph, and is kind of embodied within this, this representational framework. And I think that when you're talking about language, I think that it clearly is relating to these real patterns, but in terms of what it's actually doing, it's referring to singular items and singular singular events. And I think if you understand a representational equation like force equals mass times acceleration, what this has to be confirmed, this has to relate to this kind of generality, is it has to relate to sort of robust, subjunctively conditional counterfactual inferences in particular circumstances, like what is happening with this particular force and this particular mass, and it's incoherent to understand that outside of a law-like relation, but it refers, in terms of what it's actually referring to, is these particulars, and the relationship that we have to the universals is something that we can only achieve via degree because i don't think that the, the kind of the nature of reality in of itself is not something which i think can just be intuitively grasped it's something which you have to do active work to get closer to figuring out the nature of plato certainly didn't see grasping the forms as some passive activity no um, no i didn't yeah it's the hardest thing to do after you've completed other programs of study. That's kind of the step beyond discursive reason that you can make, but it is an active one. I think any mathematician formulating a, a theorem or a physicist generating a theory is going to have to be tied into that kind of intuitive connection. To the ground of things, the symbols, mathematical symbols that we use to write these equations depend themselves on ordinary language. This is a big point that Heisenberg makes. Mm, that yeah. Mathematical descriptions are not sufficient in themselves. They rely on a mysterious, and Heisenberg doesn't pretend that he can explain this ability, but a mysterious ability of ordinary language to go beyond particular reference, to go beyond concrete, identifiable, step-by-step -step thinking, to have a broader intuitive grasp of something that holds it all together. And I don't think, again, Platonists don't say that that intuitive grasp is infallible. It's 
a faculty along with other faculties. And I think you have to grant the existence of such a faculty of that kind of intuitive grasp of not like law-like behavior in terms of counterfactuals and making predictions, but an intuitive grasp of the likeness in the many, the one in the many that allows linguistic reference to work and also allows mathematicians to come up with the axioms that they do. I mean, such a faculty must exist. I think, again, Girdle kind of proves that such a faculty exists. I still don't really understand how nominalism is supposed to account for the efficacy. Well, I mean, for sure, I mean, you look at Frege, uh, was Frege was obviously like a sort of a contemporary, well, a 19th century thinker who, who posited the existence of abstract objects, and pretty much all of his students ended up becoming nominalists, and the most obvious one was Carnap, because it's like, you know, you take uh, the number three, and you're asking, well, what does the number three refer to? Well, it, it refers to sort of sets of three things, and those refer to like the actual concrete particulars. And so it was obvious for Carnap that when you take the number three, it's a meta language which describes how to use this idea, which itself actually refers to, again, it, it refers to particulars. In terms of sort of a broader making sense of the world, I think that you have to allow for the fact that mathematical representation is is effective, but I think that this can't be a relation of resemblance because modern mathematics and modern physics, it's very, very difficult to work out inside a resemblance picture. I mean, it's like, it tends to use group theory symmetries to explain things. And I have a very, very difficult time thinking of something like group theory in terms of some resemblance to some intuition of a form, but instead as, as a, a kind of a representational framework. And so that's generally speaking why I would have to have to side with modern philosophy here. Albeit, I mean, I think maybe it depends on how you define things. I think maybe some kind of mathematical structuralism, which essentially would be a platonic realism under some definition, could actually be true. But uh, that does that wouldn't actually change my mind on nominalism because again, I think it's this kind of semantic thesis which people get kind of a little bit. I don't know why people are so offended by it. Okay, well. Still, the way you're describing this seems very opaque to me. You're still not giving me a good explanation, to my mind, of how linguistic reference works to capture many particulars, and also what accounts for the similarity between those particulars if there's only... I mean, maybe you could define exactly what you mean by nominalism, and then maybe explain like how mathematical... Well, for example, if, if you under- say... like. Um... If you nominalize lion and you say the lion and then you make statements about it, like you say, the lion is tawny, I think that you can translate this into all lions are tawny and that you are using language to state a necessary fact about or a contingent fact about all individual lions that they that they express this. Uh, this kind of fact, but. I express this I, what? Express this fact. Express this what? What is it that language is expressing? Because you're saying all lions have X. Okay, what's X? It seems like nominalism says there is no X. There's only all. Do you get what I'm saying? Well, I think the what language is doing is it's a functional role enabling inferences about individuals. Um, that that's what language is doing. But asking why does it work? Why I'm asking why it works? Why it works? Question. I mean, it, it seems like language prima facie, relies on shared properties. You know, many individual things participate of the same property, and that's why these inferential frameworks work. And if that is not the case, and again, we can treat this as a hypothetical conjecture, is there such a thing as a real universal itself? And if you say there is not, if that's your nominalism, also I I would like to get a good definition of it from you. If your nominalism says there are no universals, then why do these inferential frameworks work? Why does language work? Language works because it's capable of understanding the patterns which are inherent to reality. What's Um, a pattern in a nominalist framework? What is a pattern? I can't think of a very good definition off the top of my head. I mean, I just still don't understand how, when you're using language, you're referring to this abstract object. And how, how would you actually know about uh, an abstract universal, even if it were real? Um, because 
your experience is itself has to be radically finite. Um, well, the idea is that the universals are in your soul and there is a sympathy between the universals that occur in the world and the universals that are there in your soul. That's uh, a common principle in Neoplatonism that all contains all, right? But according to each, Leibniz also has the same principle. So, I mean, that as a conjecture, maybe you don't find it intuitively plausible, but as a conjecture, it does work to explain how reference to universal properties could function and why we would have access to it because it's there in the soul. Maybe we can just move on to like the, the anamnesis question because that's what you had the biggest objection to as far as platonic epistemology. I mean, that, that seems like the kind of the Hegelian move is um, like philosophy has to be a, like a question of what the subject has to be able to do in order to have the world disclosed as itself intelligible. Okay. In any case, I want to get back to the anamnesis question. Yeah, yeah, I, sure. Two ways. You can interpret Plato in many things, literally or metaphorically. And there is a metaphorical interpretation of anamnesis that is, I mean, it works on a very kind of simple analogical relationship between prior structures and previous events, right? So when Plato says that we are remembering something from before we were born, if you think that the soul is made from simpler, more eternal, enduring components, then accessing those components through self-reflection is reaching back to a prior state of our being. So, I mean, just on that basis, anamnesis doesn't have to entail reincarnation. Of course, I do believe in reincarnation. I don't have a big problem with it. But, I mean, this is consistent with integrated information theory as far as one of the leading contenders of consciousness. What is consciousness? Well, it's, as Plato said, mathematical structure that does have independent existence outside of its temporal extension. So the soul is a structure that is eternal and it acts into time, just as like the laws of physics would be eternal, enduring logoi, and they have their acts in time as well. So going back to the basic structure of the soul as this mathematical entity would be kind of reaching back to a time before birth in the eternal aspect of the soul. So that's, I mean, do you have necessarily a problem with that? Have you looked at integrated information theory? I mean, that seems, Max Tegmark likes that, and Tegmark is a modern-day Platonist as well. And I just don't see any, like, obvious problem with this kind of concept of the mind, um, and it, it works with Platonic epistemology. You know, what are we doing? We are reflecting on our own nature, dividing up to those basic structural components. So at one level, mathematical proportions, you know, the, the kind of logical aspect of the soul. And then beyond that, the intuitive form giving aspects that allow for the logical aspects of the soul. Again, we have this ability of self-reflection that grounds our knowledge of ourselves. And because there is this sympathy and resemblance between our nature and the nature of other things in the world, and I think Chris Langan's notion of syndephinesis is a very powerful argument actually to that effect. We can't be completely disparate from the world. There must be some resemblance. Then um, anamnesis does kind of work to ground how we come to know uh, mathematical principles and things of that nature. Well, I, I think the problem that I'm, I'm having right now that I'm thinking is that there's essentially two different kinds of nominalism that I've been thinking about, which is on the one hand, psychological nominalism, which would be to say that kind of awareness of ontological categorical frameworks or um, elitic modal frameworks or, or deontic moral frameworks would necessarily be linguistic and therefore you would run into the same exact problems of foundationalist epistemology. It's like uh, on the one hand you have Quine where Quine critiques the idea that you have this kind of intrinsic intelligibility of an analyzed concept that you know you have to have a holism, like you have to make reference to a, a, a broader framework in order to make sense of any individual concept. On the one side of, of the, the regress stopper, and then the other side of the regress stopper being a sensory givenness, which again doesn't make sense outside of presupposing things like language acquisition and concepts to, to actually make sense of these things which aren't innate. And so, in a sense, that like actual concrete awareness in the form of knowledge of something like a form 
doesn't make sense because I don't see any way in which you can make that innate with in, in a way which just doesn't make any sense. And then there's the question of essentially what you're doing when you are using language, which is the kind of... I don't want to skip over that. You said there's no way to make it innate. Again, it, Platonism doesn't entail foundationalism epistemologically. Uh, many of Socrates' statements in the dialogues are explicitly anti-foundationalist. I mean, he embraces that hypothetical deductive method. Yeah. And we examine the system of hypotheses throughout all of their consequences and see if the whole stacks up. I mean, Plato was a kind of holist uh, epistemologically as well. So how is it that we, I mean, can we not conjecture that we have intuitive access to kind of essentials, universals that are shared between ourselves and reality? I mean, what's incoherent about that? as a hypothesis. Well, well, I mean, whenever you are having an experience, you are having an experience of something that this is kind of what, what Kant's, um, his ultimate point is, is that there's a, the, the self for Kant is a sort of the locus of responsibility where when you are making a claim, you are making an endorsement of something which can be right or wrong. And when you're using a concept, then you can be using a concept sort of correctly or incorrectly, and it has to be intelligible for a sort of a, group of, of language users, and that, that's the kind of the point of sort of transcendental unity of apperception. And the, the thing is, is this leads to a strict agnosticism about universals, insofar as that you are using these distributive singular terms, and they work, and they have authority, and they function within, uh, uh, as communicative within a group of language users, and then you sort of because these individual functional categorical terms, you can then nominalize them and say that they, you know, they're, they're referring to this abstract entity and that this seems to be a good assumption because you see blue things all over the place. I still don't see how you can have this kind of intuitive cognition of a universal because the universal never itself is present to the subject. Like, I, I don't so why, see how you could how, have anything other than- You know that it's never been itself into the subject. How do you know it's not? Well, because whenever you are using a term, you're using it to understand, say, a red thing. And red things is not a thing, which you are, which is like this abstract object. This is circular reasoning. You're assuming what you're seeking to prove here. I don't see how. You're saying that when we refer to redness, it's always particular red objects. But yes. like you're not grounding that claim. That's what you're trying. That that is the nominalist claim. So you're just asserting it. Whenever you use the term "red" as an adjective, you are describing. You are using it to describe red things. I don't think that's true. You can describe red the qualia outside of particular red objects. Yeah, but what is red qualia outside of its? Use? That's never something which anyone experiences. How do you know that the redness that occurs in your mind when you Imagine the color red, or when you experience individual red objects, the redness itself, qualitative red, how do you know that that isn't the universal itself that you're accessing? Okay, so one way of interpreting quantum mechanics would be to say that um, any finite structure is inherently surrounded by a superposition of possible contexts in which it would fit. In that kind of interpretation of quantum mechanics, each individual finite system is a universal in a certain respect. Like so-called particular objects aren't particular, they're not unique in space and time. They themselves are always situated in a, a superposition of possible contexts which are consistent with them mathematically, logically, etc. So if that's the way it works, then when you experience a mental property, it doesn't have to be a unique and one-off event, a unique and one-off qualitative reality. That qualitative reality can be identical in all of its instantiations. It, it can be the one and the same redness that is occurring in many different contexts. And I don't see anything incoherent about that. So if that's a hypothesis, that would then give you uh, intuitive access to universals. And it would be what allows sense perception to work anyway. I mean, and I'm not really... saying uh, we necessarily know that a priori in a foundationalist way, just that it's a coherent hypothesis and it has some explanatory power. And I don't see the explanatory power of why language works from nominalists.
because it, it depends on pattern recognition and you weren't able to give a definition of a pattern. So it's like, okay, what are you even, what's the hypothesis exactly on the other hand? Yeah, I mean, um, I think um, I've, I've performed pretty poorly in this conversation. So I mean, I hope that you got at least something out of it. I mean, um, I definitely have to rethink and, and go over a lot, of, a lot of things, but I certainly don't feel like I've wasted my time by, by having the conversation, but... Yeah, I found the conversation very enjoyable and you're a very bright guy, I can tell. Um, I'm not familiar with your thought in general. So like a lot of when I was saying like you're not what you're putting forward, I don't understand might be on me as well because I'm not familiar with your language. Yeah, no, and the, absolutely. But um, I, just as a closing statement, I would say the way you framed it initially, I disagree with that like mainstream modern philosophy is this kind of nominalist approach and it like I just, I disagree. There are many active Platonists out there in the intellectual world. Maybe it's a minority position, but among physicists, it's not. Most of them are some form of Platonic realist. Well, I, I it, tend it, to think um, that it, it comes down to how you define things because you can have a sort of a very weak form of Platonism or a very strong form of it. Uh, you can have sort of local or global forms of it. Like it, it very much depends, but, but yeah. So two things then just my, my takeaway at the end of the day here is like, I don't think Platonism in some form is indefensible in the modern day. I think many of the people we referenced here, Frege, Gödel, like influential Leibniz, influential people in modern philosophy, broadly speaking, were Platonists. It is a tenable position. It's not like it's indefensible. And so I, I don't think, and it's, it would be an argument ad populum to say like, well, I mean, this is not, it doesn't fit in with, uh, modern philosophy modern philosophy itself quote unquote isn't one unified thing there are many different positions that yeah, one can no, defend I mean, um, has solutions I tend to think that like the um, people tend to be coping when they are using stuff like wolfgang smith and they say that you know you can make sense of modern physics using aristotle in particular um but you could the the in terms of small p platonism uh you have probably quite a bit more sort of wiggle room there i think uh there, there'll be far more people who would be willing to go along with that yeah the other side of it though is that people in general underestimate plato himself a lot of these problems with linguistic reference and things like that like plato already dealt with this stuff himself in his own dialogues they're difficult to read and it takes a lot of time and you know not a lot of people want to read the neoplatonists but if you spend the time in the tradition i don't think they're as backwards and, and unfit in terms of a, a theoretical landscape as some people would think i think resurrecting them is potentially a, a kind of uh shortcut to have access to a lot of key insights it, it just makes sense you had very smart people over hundreds of years. I think that there's, um, the th there's certainly they may have some, thought, even if their yeah. whole system doesn't work, they may have had good insights and it's worth looking into. I think that there's certainly some platonic dialogues and some neoplatonic texts, which are extremely gnomic, but that's not universally the case. Certainly there's some, which are very, very clear. Uh, yeah, true, true. I mean, um, but, I, I don't really understand. I don't understand the Amplicus. I don't understand a number of other ones. Um, <laughs> well, right. well, often the ones that are the least clear are the texts that have like the most core insights and Plato did that deliberately. So we had kind of a spectrum of like more exoteric dogmas and then more esoteric ones. And so anyway, I, I wouldn't underestimate Platonism. I wouldn't like write it off as not worth our time. I also like if we're going to defend nominalism instead, I've yet to hear a real coherent nominalist ontology that accounts for the efficacy of the names that we give to things. And, you know, people can disagree about that. And but well, that's uh, again, kind of I, the problem is that nominalism as a philosophy of language, I think, has a lot of potential. But then thinking about the ontological implications of that is very difficult because the sort of prime 20th century nominalist in my mind is Wilfred Sellers um, and his like ontology is extremely weird uh, like almost nobody adopted it's this kind of odd pure process stuff and so his students ended up just um, they ended up all going back to Hegel and so they they adopted his like nominalist theory of language but then ended up rejecting using it to overcome uh, a nominalist ontology and this is stuff that I'm still trying to think about, but 
But yeah, I mean, I, I certainly enjoyed the conversation. I mean, yep. Good talking to you. Take care.